Okay, so we're starting this week with how to solve first order differential equations. And uh, we'll start with something which might seem a little familiar. Because this is actually the very last thing that gets talked about in the first semester of calculus class here. And that's separable differential equations. And so the name is very suggestive. There's a, a separation that goes on. And so what's the type of problem? Well, the type of problem is whenever you have y prime, can be written as a function of x times a function of y. So, so you have some multiplication where it's just only things involving x multiplying only things involving y. All right. So that's the setup. Now, what's the procedure? And the procedure is actually very simple. It's a very lovely sequence of ideas. So the, the name is very indicative of where we're going. So the first step right here, I like to call this separate. So in other words, we say, hey, we're going to put everything with y on one side, everything with x on the other. So you'll see you have your dy over g of y. That's only y's. You have your f of x dx, only x. You say, all right, great. So now, what have we done? Well, we've separated the two. And the nice thing is that there's no sort of x, y interchange going on on the same side. And so we can think of it as saying, oh, what we really have is the derivative on one side is just involving the y. And on the other side, it's just involving the x. And somehow we've, we sort of separated them into their two parts. And that brings us to step two, which is to say after you've separated, now you integrate. So what is that? Well, you simply integrate both sides. So you do that. You say, all right, find the integral g of y dy. That's the same integral f of x dx. And indeed, what we're really exploiting here is that if two functions agree, and you can think of it as these two agree, then their antiderivatives agree up to a plus c. All right, so you separate, you integrate, and then the last step, well, we've got this pattern going here, eight, eight, so I like to call this uncomplicate, which is a very complicated word. But really what we're saying is after you've integrated, you've essentially solved. Now, there might be things you want to do. You might want to solve for your constant c. Uh, that would happen if you have some initial conditions. You might want to solve for your y. Or you might not be able to. You'll notice here it says answer might be an implicit function. That means that you can't solve for y. You have some sort of expression, but that's OK. It's perfectly fine to, to leave it in that form. All right, so the procedure for today, and this is all we're doing today, separate, integrate, uncomplicate. Those three steps. All right, well, that's the theory. That was quick. Any questions on the theory part before we go to the practice part? All right, well, let's practice. Our first problem, find the general solution for x squared plus 1 times tangent of y, y prime equals x. All right, so one of the things that we want to do is, is learn to identify what type of tools to use. So is there anything here that says, ha, this might be a good tool to use for, you know, separable differential equations. Is there anything that says, aha, let's try that? The thing that you look for is, can you separate? If you can separate, do it. And if you can't, try something else. And you're like, well, we don't have anything else. Well, come back next time. You'll have something else. All right, so put things on, this, on the one side. So tangent of y, y prime equals x. So we can move the x across. So we can write this as tangent of y times y prime is x divided by x squared plus 1. To move it across, we would divide. Now, when I'm doing separable differential equations, 
I like to abuse notation. And you might wonder, what does that mean? Well, tangent of y, y prime, can also be thought of as tangent of y times dy dx. Now, that's not really abuse of notation, but here we go. When you look at this expression, dy over dx, you're like, oh, that's like a dy over a dx. You're like, ah, let's think about these as two different things. And we say, okay, so imagine moving the dx across. So you write tangent y dy equals x over x squared plus 1 dx. Now this seems okay. And it is a, a small abuse of notation, but one that we're okay with. And the reason I say it's an abuse of notation, dy over dx is not two separate things. It's actually one whole thing put together. And so but we're treating it like it is two separate things. And uh, it's okay. It's okay to do that. All right. So, have we separated? Yes. Yes. Each side has only one of the two variables. What comes next? Integrate. Integrate. All right. You're, you're picking up. All right. So, what's the integral of tangent of y? Oh, 1 over y squared plus 1 would be the derivative of arc tangent. Uh, secant, ta secant tangent, the derivative of, of secant is secant tangent. The natural log of secant plus tangent is the antiderivative of secant. Secant squared is the derivative of tangent. So we're, we're having fun. We're, we're dancing all around it. Log secant. Okay, good. Now you're like, ah, what if I forget that on a quiz? What's the answer? Turn the quiz over, and there's a formula sheet, and it's on the formula sheet. What? Oh my gosh. So. Uh. So, okay, all right. Other side. The integral of x over x squared plus 1. That one's not on the formula sheet, so. But, but can we integrate that? <laughs> now, a few people are saying arc tangent. Is this integral arc tangent? No. Uh, but it looks like it. Like x squared plus 1 downstairs feels arc tangent -y. The x upstairs sort of throws a wrench into it. Somebody mentioned a natural log. Could that work? Yeah, there, there's a use of. Now, this is a, a use of that you can almost do in your head, and if you did, we, we would trust you. But in case you don't trust me, we'll, we'll do it together. So the substitution would be the downstairs. That would be, we'll call it a name, we'll call it u. So u equals x squared plus 1. What, what is du? 2x dx. I'm like, ooh, x dx. Like, great. So we can, we can move that 2 to the other side. So a half du is x dx. So, so this x dx becomes a half du. So this would be the integral of 1 half, uh, 1 over u du. Which, okay, we know that that's one-half natural log u. And then you put back what u is. So one-half natural log x squared plus 1. All right, are we missing anything? Plus c. Plus c. Now, wait a second. Shouldn't we have a plus c over here as well, or a plus d? They merge. Ah, yeah. See, it's, it's absolutely true that we could put one there. We wouldn't be wrong, but the thing is, but I should write a plus d plus a one-half. Yeah. Okay, maybe if I could. I shouldn't try to talk and write at the same time. That's a very dangerous thing to do because when I do, I, I get lost. So anyways, dramatic pause. 
If I did put constants on both sides, it wouldn't be wrong, but it would be redundant. Because what you could do is say, look, I could move this constant to the other side, and then I have c minus d, but, but if I take a constant minus a constant, it's still a, a constant. It's just a bigger constant. So he said, we'll put a bigger c there. So that the constants absorb together. So you only need a plus a constant on one side. All right, good. Now, we could say that this is kind of the answer, but let's clean it up a little bit. Let's actually solve for y. We can do that. We have the technology. So let's start peeling our onion here. Uh, how do we get y out? Raise both sides to the power e. Okay, so we have e, and I'll just do it very slowly here so that you see what's going on. e to the log secant y is e to the one half log x squared plus one and plus c. Okay, so I think the left hand side is not too surprising what's going to happen. e to the natural log secant y gives us secant y. Now, up here, e to the log, well, e to the one half log x squared plus one. Let's see if we can't write that in a nicer way. Uh, what can you do with this one half? Sorry, what? So what can you do with this half? Put it in. Yeah, so there's the nice property of logarithms that says if you have a constant in front of the log, you can move it in as an exponent. So it's really like log of x squared plus 1 to the 1 half power. Now the other thing is I, I have a plus c. And what I can do is I can think of this as times e to the c. So I can say e to the 1 half log x squared plus 1 e to the c. All right. So, if we've done this first part here, move the half inside, we have e to the log, we'll have square root x squared plus 1. Yes? All right. What about this e to the c? What is that? It's just a constant. E to a constant is a constant. So constants can absorb other constants along the way. And so we say, you know what, we'll just write it. We could choose a new symbol, or we could just say, look, it's still just our constant. We'll just write C again. So we have secant of Y is some constant square root of X squared plus 1. Finally, how do we get Y outside of the secant? Take the arc secant of both sides. Take the arc secant. So arc secant is just a fancy way of saying the inverse function of secant. So Y is arc secant of some constant c, and that constant depends on what initial conditions you want to satisfy, square root x squared plus 1, and that's it. There we go. Life is good. Life is good. All right. So we had our, our separate, not too bad, our integrate, mildly interesting, and our uncomplicate had a fun few things along the way. But that's the process. That's the process. All right. Well, uh, OK. Let's try another one. I think I might mix things up and do them in a slightly different order here. OK. Find y, given that y prime equals y squared plus 1, and y of 0 equals 1. And then there's a second part. Determine the interval for which the solution is valid. All right. Hmm. Well, let's begin. Uh, is this separable? I mean, hopefully, because everything we're going to do today is separable, so the answer should always be yes today. Yes. So, yes. How do we separate? So, so you have dy dx is y squared plus 1. Would you just subtract the y squared? 
Well, we don't want to subtract the y squared, because what we really want is we want to have a function of y times the dy. So we don't want to bring this stuff over by subtraction, but there's other tools to bring stuff over. Oh, we could multiply by dx, sure. y squared plus 1 dx, but this is not quite separate because you have x's and y's mixing together. So we could divide by y squared plus 1. All right, there we go. dy over y squared plus 1 equals dx. Okay, that's separated. All right, separation complete. What comes next? <laughs> Integrate. So the integral of dy over y squared plus 1 is arc tangent. Ah, oh, come on. You had to know that was coming sometime today. <laughs> integral of dx. x, and then, of course, plus a c. All right, so now let's pause and say we have an initial condition. y of 0 equals 1. Now it turns out that we have a choice. We can either try to get y by itself first and then solve for c, or we can solve for c first and then get y by itself. In other words, at this point, you can either solve for c early or late. Do you want to solve for c now or do you want to solve for c later? Now. It's our c. We want it now. All right. Great. We can do that for you. All right, so y of 0 equals 1. So that says when you plug in x equals 0, you get out y equals 1. So you put in arctangent of 1, because that's our y value, equals 0 plus c. So we put in x equals 0, y equals 1, all right. Do we know what arctangent of 1 is? Pi over 4. If, if you don't quite remember what arctangent 1 is, think about the different way to ask the question. If I'm trying to find arctangent of 1, it's the same as asking tangent of what angle gives 1. And there's not too many angles that we have to remember. It's a 45 degrees, but we're in calculus, so we don't do 45. We say pi over 4. Okay. So there's our, our constant. All right. So now we're pretty close. So arctangent of y is x plus pi over 4. So what's the last thing for us to do to get y? Take the tangent of both sides. So essentially we're, we're freeing up the y from inside the tangent. So equals tangent of x plus pi over 4. All right, so that's our solution. So this is the correct solution to this differential equation with this initial condition. But it's not going to be valid everywhere. Well, maybe it is. We suspect not, given the second part of the question. So the second part says, where is this valid? Well, in some sense, we, we know it's going to be valid at 0 because we start there. What do we know about tangent? has lots of asymptotes. So, so let's just, for a second, let's just draw only tangent of x, just for reference. So do you remember where the asymptotes for tangent of x are? Pi over 2 is one of them. And there's a negative pi over 2 is another one of them. And it turns out that they're equally spaced. So there's like one at 3 pi over 2 and negative 3 pi over 2 and so forth and so on. So tangent looks something roughly like that, just repeating over and over again. Now the plus pi over 4 has taken our, our tangent curve, and what's the result? So adding pi over 4 has done what to our picture? Yeah, shifted it some way. See? Boom, shifted left. Yeah, that's about the level of visual effects we can afford. Like, boop, yep, there we go. All right, so the real question is, of course, where are our asymptotes at? Because this function, 
y squared plus 1, that, you know, if we go back to when we talked about when our solution is valid, it's such a brilliant, beautiful function. There's no problems with it. This is as nice a function as we can hope for. So the problems would be at asymptotes. So think about how far would we have to go to reach an asymptote. So given that at x equals 0, I'm at pi over 4, how far up can I go in for x before I hit my asymptote? Yeah. When I hit plug in pi over 4 into my solution, I will be at my asymptote again. So nothing can be said about what happens at anything above pi over 4. That's just out. Going the other direction, how far down can I go? So it, if you shift, so it's like we, we're at negative pi over 2, but we've moved over. So it would be at negative 3 pi over 4. So there's our shift. And again, we can't say anything about that. So we are valid between negative 3 pi over 4 and to pi over 4. I don't include them because those points aren't part of the function. Our function is blown up. All right. Good. Well, it's nice to do one of these questions about when is a solution valid? Okay. Well, find y of x, given that y prime equals 3x squared e to the minus y, and y of 2 equals 0. Let's just go through it. Okay, so to separate, well, again, I, I like to think y prime dy dx. This just helps me. If it helps you, that's great. If it doesn't, you don't have to. And uh, so separation. The e to the minus y comes across. On the other side, what would it become? E to the y. So, so one way you can think of e to the minus y is as 1 over e to the y. So this could have been rewritten as 3x squared over e to the y at the start. So separation then, it's almost like you're doing cross multiplying in this case. So e to the y dy equals 3x squared dx. And now integrate. So separation was quick, integrate, integrate, e to the y equals x cubed plus c, no surprises. And uh, we can solve for c right away uh, by plugging in x equals 2, y equals 0. And we say, OK, we have e to the 0, also known as 1, equals 2 cubed plus c. And uh, well, 2 cubed is 8. Move that across. Indeed, it looks like, ah. Life is, is, we're pretty optimistic here. And finally taking the natural log to pull it out. So we have natural log of e to the y, which is y, is the natural log of this other side, x cubed plus c. Yep, all right. See, these are not so bad. Not so bad. All right, so let's do another harmless looking one. All right. I'm sure it, nothing will go astray here. OK. Find y of x. So we have to solve all the way down to y. You know, we can't leave it in implicit form. It says y of x. So we're going to do it all the way. Given that y prime equals x over 2y plus 4, and y of square root of 7 is equal to 0. Well, OK. That's all right. No worries. All right. So. Well, what's our first step in these types of problems? Separate. I mean, the real first step is saying, what type of problem is it? But we kind of know. It's like, OK, today is separable differential equation. All right, separate. All right, so here is another case where you could essentially just cross multiply, like move the 2y plus 4 across, move the dx across, 2y plus 4 times dy is equal to x times dx. What's next? Integrate. Integrate. I, I know, I know. Like, we know all this. Yeah, practice, practice is good. OK, so we integrate. Integral of 2y plus 4. y squared plus 4y. Integral of x. 
half x squared, or x squared over 2, and plus c. Great. Well, let's, uh, let's solve for c. Okay, so if you wanted to solve for c, well, what we're going to plug in x is square root of 7, plug in y equals 0. So, we're going to get 0 squared plus 4 times 0 is equal to 1 half times square root of 7 squared plus c. So, what will c turn out to be? Okay, yeah, because the zeros go away, uh, it's negative 7 halves. All right, well, that's an interesting choice they made, but okay, great. So now we're at this stage. y squared plus 4y is equal to 1 half x squared minus 7 halves. Are we done? Some people are like, yeah, give me the thumbs up. Some people are like, no. Give me the thumbs, well, no one's giving me the thumbs down. Oh, All right, now I'm getting it now, okay. I'm seeing some no's here. Now, if, it, if we had just said find any solution, you can make an argument that you're fine. This is an implicit solution. But what were we asked to find? Y of x, when it says find y of x, that means you gotta go all the way. One y. 1y to rule them all, 1y to find them. Now, the problem is we don't have 1y. All right, so how can we solve for y? Complete the square. Complete the square, ah, oh, interesting choice. All right, let's try that. So for those fans of algebra, y squared plus 4y, what would I have to add on to this part so that this would be a perfect square, I think? Anyone? Four. four? Okay, now you might say, how are you getting the four? You're just copying? No, no, there's a procedure. Assuming that this coefficient is one, which it is, take the middle term, divide by two, and then you square that. So two squared, four. Now, I can't just add four here. I gotta do the same thing over here. So I'll, I'll add four. Oh, that's not so bad, is it? So y squared plus 4y plus 4 becomes y plus 2 squared. That's why we completed the square. You know, we looked at it and, and we said, what can we make so that you complete me? You know, we want that to be a perfect square. All right. So on the other side, what do we get? So minus 7 halves is like minus 3.5. So we'll end up with a half x squared plus a half. All right, we're close. We're doing, we're doing really well. Okay. Now what? Square root both sides. Great. So we get y plus 2 is the square root of 1 half x squared plus a half, with a suspicious gap here. Plus or minus. Plus or minus. Yes. Two possibilities. All right, well, almost there. Now, we subtract. So y equals negative two, plus or minus the square root of a half x squared plus a half. Are we done? Yes. yes. And why not? <laughs> There's an ambiguity here. This isn't one function, but we've written down two functions. We have negative two plus something. We have negative two minus something. We need to make a choice. So you must choose, but choose wisely. For as the right choice will give you points, the wrong choice will take them from you. So, do we choose the plus? Or do we choose the minus? 
And why is it that we choose the plus? So, which one should we pick? Okay. All right, you seem to think it's a plus. We'll write that down. Negative 2 plus the square root of 1 half x squared plus a half. Okay. Can anyone justify that it's the plus? Square root will always be positive. Uh, So someone is saying we get negative numbers. Why is that? But I mean, negative numbers aren't the worst thing in the world. Why is it bad here? Yeah, the initial condition comes in for round two. We have to make sure that this initial condition is satisfied. So negatives are bad here, because if I take a negative and I subtract more from it, I can't get to zero. So negative 2 minus something will never get me square, sorry, never get me up to 0. So it has to be negative 2 plus something that gives me what we need. And that's the answer. That's the answer. All right. Well, time for a little bit of physics. Yay! Newton's law of cooling. So. The idea of Newton's law of cooling, you can imagine that you have an environment. It might be perhaps a, a cold environment. So you have like an ice box or something. And, and in this cold environment, you put in a very warm object. So here's our very warm object. It's red hot when it goes into that cold space. And the question is, what's happening to the temperature of this item that you've inserted, this object? And the punchline, of course, is that over time, this object will cool off. And it will become what the ambient temperature of its environment is. OK, so that's what's going to happen in the long run. Now, Newton's law of cooling says, well, how is the temperature changing? And, and Newton said, well, it's proportional. So there's always proportion means there's some constant. And uh, that constant, of course, depends upon sort of, in some sense of like how well the object absorbs the ambient temperature. But it's proportional to the difference between the current temperature of the object and the temperature of the space it's in. So if they're very far apart, so in other words, it's a very hot object in a very cold space, the temperature will change quickly. If the temperatures are close together, it's a lukewarm object in a slightly more lukewarm state the temperature difference is very small, the change will be smaller. So the change is proportional to how far apart they are. So that's what this is saying. Your change is proportional to how far apart they are. So that's not such a bad idea. I mean, that seems pretty straightforward. So, all right. So now we want to actually solve this differential equation. So this is a differential equation. How does the temperature change? We see that T prime. We want to solve for T. So we're going to think of uh, capital T as our temperature, and we're going to think of lowercase t as time, because we're thinking here what happens to our temperature over time. All right, so k is a number. It's not a variable, it's a number. What's the first thing we do to solve this differential equation? What? Separate. Separate. Yeah, dt over t minus a equals minus k dt. Now what? Integrate. Where do we get when we integrate the left-hand side? Natural log of t minus a is equal to, over here, negative kt plus c. Now, we could solve for c now, but this is a case that natural log, eh, I'm not a big fan of it. We'll wait. We'll solve for c in a minute. OK, so what can we do here? 
I want to get capital T by itself. The good news is there's only one capital T. We just got to sort of free it. Right. Use exponentials. So we are now up to T minus A is equal to, here I have E to the minus KT plus C. Now E to the minus KT can't do much with that. But this plus C, what can I do with that C? Yeah, I can essentially think about this as being e to the c, which means it's like its own constant, so I can pull it in front. So it's some constant e to the minus kt. So our temperature is the ambient temperature plus some constant c, e to the minus kt. Now let's solve for c, because we, we do need to solve for t, c and we have an initial condition. So when we plug in little t equals zero, the temperature is T naught, so T naught is equal to A plus C. So what does that say about C? C is T naught minus A, right? Just subtract A. So our final answer is our temperature behaves like the ambient temperature plus, take T naught, subtract A, E to the minus KT. Now, if you think about what happens here, if you plug in time equals zero, E to the minus zero does what? It becomes one. So the A plus T naught minus A, the A's cancel, and you're left with the initial temperature. Now, let time run forward. As time gets bigger and bigger, what happens to e to the minus kt? Goes to zero. Goes to zero. So e to a large negative number goes to zero. So in the long run, the last part disappears, and what do we have? We have a. So this matches the intuition. Initially, the temperature is t zero. In the long run, it approaches A. And so you can say that pictorial-wise, you have A here, and then you have a T0, and it approaches it something like the tail of an exponential. It approaches it, never quite gets there. Well, such is the life of mathematicians. All right. So that's. That's it. That's the whole thing. We've derived it. All right. Well, uh, let's see if we can get this example done. All right. A four pound roast, initially at 50 degrees, is placed in a 375 degree oven at 5 p.m. And after 75 minutes, it is found that the temperature of the roast is 125. When will the roast be 150? The medium rare. All right, good. Cooking lessons. All right, so the four pound roast, what does this four pound roast correspond with in the story here? This is our object. It's what we put in the oven. It's our object. Now, does the four matter? No, it's all misdirection. It's trying to make you think, oh, ha, 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 here's the number. I'm going to make you think about me. All right. We're not going to fall for its tricks. 50 degrees Fahrenheit. What is this representing? T naught. All right. It's placed in a 375 degree oven. Okay, what's 375? It's A, it's the, the ambient environment. After 75, it says at 5 p.m. 5 p.m. doesn't really matter because the key thing is, is not the time you start, but the time that's elapsed. After 75 minutes, it is found that the temperature of the roast is 125. Now you might say, wait, we have our, 
our T's here, we have our A. Well, what don't we have? We don't have K. So, so this information is probably going to be useful to solve for K, is our guess. Somehow K is in here, and we just have to find it. And then, then we have to say, when will the rows be 150? All right. So let's, uh, let's quickly get through what we can say here. Well, we know Newton's law of cooling. We can just copy it. It's our ambient temperature, 375, plus our, our T naught uh, minus A. So that'll be 50 subtract 375, which will actually be a negative number, so minus 325, and then it'll be e to the minus kt. So we already have it there. Why rederive it? Okay, so there's our temperature. So plug in 75. Uh, we're going to follow the, the line here. So at 75, our temperature is 125. So that's going to be the same as if we take 375, subtract 325, e to the minus k times 75. All right? Now, what do we do? Solve for k. Solve for k. Yeah, we're going to just gently massage and say, hello, formula. Can you give us k, please? So we can move some things around, we'll swap sides, 325 e to the minus k times 75 is equal to uh, 250. Let's take 375, subtract 125. We can even then go one step further, we can divide by 325 here. And of course 250 divided by 325 is something, true story. Uh, they're both divisible by 25. So, for example, 250 divided by 25 is 10. 325 divided by 25 would be 13. So 10 thirteenths. All right, and now we take the log. So minus k times 75 is natural log of 10 over 13. Now you might say, wait, that's a negative. Well, so is natural log of 10 over 13. So, if you really want, you can do this as minus log of 13 over 10. Aha, now you have a negative 2. So everybody's negative. This is the fancy thing. If you flip something on the inside of a log, you, m you make it negative. All right, so punchline is k is 175th log 13 tenths. There's a problem that physicists do these with calculators because they are like, ah, I'll just punch this in. Now, are we done? No. What do we need to do? Well, we need to find the time because there's a when, that's a time. And we need to be 150. So we need to say, okay, so 150 equals 375 minus 325 e to the minus kt. So I'm going to leave, the, the k is what it is. It's just it's simple to write it as k like that right now. Do the same thing. Move stuff around. So 325 e to the minus kt would be uh, 225. Then you divide. This is equal to 9 over 13. Take the log of both sides. You get minus k times t is the log of 9 over 13. And now we say, aha, but we know what k is. And so for our final answer, what we'll do, uh, I'm sorry, this is minus log of 13 ninths. So, do, 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 do. So the, the punchline here is if I had space, here we go, now we have space. We would say that t is 1 over k, natural log 13 over 9. But we have k, so 1 over k, we're going to make this 75 uh, 
log 13 over 9 over log 13 over 10. And that's the time. We're done.